Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 teaches us to never meet your heroes, because they might give you and everyone you know space cancer. As we saw in Volume 1, director James Gunn loves to hide all kinds of secrets in the production design, soundtrack, and in this case, bones! I made some headway with a long lost Volume 1 easter egg, so you know I'm all boned up for Volume 2. Crazy? Don't care, let's do this. Volume 2 opens with Peter Quill's mother Meredith and his father Ego. Once again, the awesome mix soundtrack tells Meredith's whole story. Brandy, you're a fine girl by looking glass actually has some bummer lyrics about a sailor who abandons his lady just like ego admits to doing to meredith later brandy you're a fine girl what a good wife you would be my life my love my lady is the sea cares so little for meredith that he whistles this song her favorite song as he takes a piss Ego's Ford Mustang 2 King Cobra has the same color scheme that Peter will later use for the Milano. And as they drive into the DQ, there's a cameo by James Gunn's late doggo, Dr. Wesley Von Spears, who also cameoed in Volume 1. The Guardians now take down an abolisk, a pest on the Sovereign, because according to Gunn, it feeds on their nuclear fuel. Quill uses a modified 1977 Mattel handheld electronic football game as a sensor, and he argues with Gamora over using her sword. I thought your thing was a sword. Which she ends up having to use, since this is an interdimensional beast, and she's got the super powerful God Slayer. Once again here, Quill insists on diegetic musical accompaniment from his mom's awesome mix, Mr. Blue Sky, which is an ironically sunny tune for the hellish battle. Baby Groot's blissful dance echoes Quill's or lonely, whacking opening dance in volume one. James Gunn never cuts, he contributes his own happy dance mocap to, and he spent two years on Groot singing in the rain here. Because as this film's unlikely guru later explains, now, There are two types of beings in the universe. Those who dance, and those who do not. Mm -hmm. Gunn said the sequel is all about family versus ego, and not just the literal ego, but how toxic self-centeredness poisons the tribe. Groot freezes in front of Drax, just as he did at the end of Volume 1, because he knows Drax and his wife were non-dancers. He doesn't want that divide to alienate him from his brother. Groot shares duet moments with each guardian until Drax crashes everything. Groot stays mad at him throughout the film until the very end where he shows his true love for him. The genetics-obsessed Aisha asks about Quill's father. An unorthodox genealogy. A hybrid that seems particularly reckless. Quill begins this movie thinking genetic bloodlines dictate what family means, but that is an egotistical view. Rocket steals Annulax batteries. Arbulary batteries. No, Drax. And these batteries are a key device for plot and theme. They parallel the way Ego uses Quill as a battery. You'll have to learn by spending the next thousand years as a battery! Yondu later tells the battery-stealing Rocket, I know who you are, boy, because you're me! And Battery Quill was an asset that Yondu stole from Ego. And as Ego implanted cancer in Meredith's brain, Rocket and Groot implant these explosive batteries in Ego's brain, poetic justice. And they use Baby Groot's ability to squeeze into small places, the same way that Yondu used Skinny Quill for thieving. It's all connected! Quill's shirt translates to Gears Shift, with the smaller words beside it, dust, cement, stone, and ash. Underneath, it all says a Teniac Galaxy Invention for Karen Teniac, the film's wardrobe designer. And my favorite detail in this film, just noticed it in the most recent rewatch, a full beat before Drax sneaks up on Quill. If you look closely, you can see Drax blending in invisibly behind Gamora and Nebula as they pass. Perfectly still. So great. They pilot through a quantum asteroid field like Han in Empire Strikes Back, except these asteroids disappear and reappear, similar to the trippy quantum mechanics that the Avengers used to hijack time travel in Endgame. Quill and Rocket's family-destroying ego match fittingly ends with the arrival of capital E Ego. His ship is designed to reflect an egg like Mork's ship from Mork and Mindy, this film is filled with reproductive imagery, from Ego's seed in the opening scene, to the way he impregnates this egg vessel, to the spermy shape it later takes, and the fact that he uses egg-shaped tableaus to tell his horny life story about how he's trying to impregnate the whole universe. 
Now the jump point in this movie is a hexagonal portal. And from then on the MCU, it's known as the Universal Neural Teleportation Network. It's first introduced here in this movie, and then it becomes the MCU's superhighway. Thanks for the world building gun! And the moment they enter Bearhart's atmosphere, the Milano bursts into flames from atmospheric friction along with Drax. Bearhart is a planet from the whole comics, and here Gunn gives it these coordinates, as with all the locations in both of his films. In my volume one breakdown, I explained how the long lost missing Easter egg is actually a secret message encoded into the coordinates, discovered way back by YouTuber MT, and years later, still being deciphered by the Guardians of the Galaxy Discord community. Their translation for the Volume 1 coordinates is something about Meredith Quill, which Gunn has graded as 70% correct. Their latest Volume 2 coordinate translation is Biomedical Clinic 89P13, Half World Cage C, Mission Plan is to Seek IO, Wyndham Built Math, He's a Smart uh, Attack ICBM. So the theory is that Rocket, who is Xander our ID number 89P13 will have his mystery origin revealed in Volume 3 as the genetic experiment from Half World of Herbert Wyndham, the high evolutionary from the Marvel comics. All maybe to resemble an Earth raccoon and for some ICBM related plot. I'm thinking maybe the one Ant Man and the Wasp foiled in the 80s. Moments earlier in this film, Rocket said, I was cybernetically engineered to pilot a spacecraft. And later, Yondu says, I know them scientists what made you never gave a rat's ass about you. I'm serious. So yeah, Someone built this trash panda, and I think we will find out who. Here, Quill tells Nebula, You know, you'd think an evil supervillain would learn how to properly lie. In Infinity War and in Endgame, Nebula's father, Thanos, never lies. My father is many things. A liar is not one of them. And in this movie, Ego doesn't lie. He just gradually reveals more and more of the truth until we hate him. On to Contraxia, the Ravagers hangout that they actually all arrive from in Endgame. How are the Duck cameos again here? And in Yondu's room, in the background, there's a picture of Wal Russ, who accompanies Rocket and Groot in the comics. Yondu fights with Stakar Ogord. But you'll never hear the horns of freedom when you die, Yondu. And the colors of Ogord will never flash over your grave mad because Yondu traffics kids. But Yondu actually did it as a merciful move. See, Yondu was outcast because he's too proud to admit he kept Quill out of that familial love. Ego tells Quill, Yondu kept you. I have no clue as to why. Yeah, Ego definitely couldn't imagine anyone who would want to keep a son without an evil use for that son. But again, the guru speaks. I thought Yondu was your father. Because he was his daddy. Gamora reminds Quill how he would tell people his dad was David Hasselhoff. Later, Quill describes the Hoff as this. He's a singer and actor from Earth, really famous guy. I love how he says singer first. Hoff, of course, cameos later. And in the credits, he sings lead on composer Tyler Bates' Guardian's Inferno song with Gunn singing backup. As the group splits up, Quill plays Fleetwood Mac's The Chain, a song recorded when that band was going through some nasty divorces. So by leaving with Ego, Quill is breaking the chain of his real family. Mantis puts Ego to sleep, explaining, I can make a stubborn person compliant, but I mostly use it to help my master sleep. He lies awake at night thinking about his progeny or how he killed them. In Infinity War, Mantis uses the same move on Thanos, who in that moment dreams about how he killed his daughter Gamora. Onto Ego's planet, where we hear George Harrison's My Sweet Lord, a song about a more intimate relationship with God, which mixes both Hindu and Judeo-Christian names for God, reflecting how Ego is a father to countless races. These domes look kind of like the tops of skulls, maybe a hint of the deadly truth of Ego's dead kids creeping up from below this utopian surface. Ego's wardrobe design also embodies this idea on the surface gold and luster, but underneath cold, deliberate clockwork to move on to the next cog. Ego says he's a celestial, originating as a brain floating in space. This is all based on the theoretical physics concept of the Boltzmann brain, which proposes that in a chaotic universe, we are statistically more likely to be self-contained minds that imagine our realities around us than we are actual beings in a shared reality, which is basically a scientific justification for the triumph of one's ego over the tribe. You all only exist because I conceived you two. And the guru speaks again. When you're ugly and someone loves you, you know they love you for who you are. Beautiful people never know who to trust. This explains why the Guardians are such a tight-knit family. They're all goofy looking broken toys. Pretty Marvel heroes like Thor though, constantly betrayed. He's a beautiful idiot. Quill tries to recreate his genuine chemistry with Gamora in Volume 1, this time with Sam Cooke's Bring It On Home To Me, a song that's really a thirsty attempt to woo an uninterested lady. Peter immaturely compares their will-they-won't-they they chemistry to Sam and Diane from Cheers. When are we gonna do something about this unspoken thing between us? 
fails because he's channeling ego, not family. I finally found my family. Don't you understand that? I thought you already had. I love how immediately after this, Gamora sees two weeds rubbing against each other, dancing in the wind, and no dancing. Nebula North by Northwest, her sister, and the ensuing argument reveals it wasn't Nebula's competitive pride that drives her, it is family. Yes. You were the one who wanted to win, and I just wanted a sister! And the sisters find Ego's corpse pile, which Gunn recently tweeted was filled with unidentified Easter eggs, and all of you were like, ooh, corpses? Let Voss take a whiff! Like a YouTube paleontologist, Indiana Bones. But, you know, I think we were able to find some stuff, so let's do it, corpse day. For a bone. Okay, on the boulder to the left, I think that could be a Gungan from Star Wars. You said nada celestial. Blech. On the right, I wanna say that's Stitch? Crash land in the wrong universe, a-hole. Now the close-ups of the heap show what looks like a Corbinite skull. Kinda like the one Quill slapped on Morag in volume one. That's a race of Beta Ray Bill. Also shows up in Thor Ragnarok. Nearby, there are some long fingers with joints similar to the facehugger in the Alien franchise, but I have a feeling that they wouldn't include recognizable skulls of characters owned by other movie studios at that time. There's a set photo that gives us a real clear look at the pile that they used for the close-ups. The one right in the middle kind of looks like a duck. Maybe another duck world in aside from Howard the Duck or Donald or Daisy. New Master 68 on our Discord said that the one beneath looks like Davy Jones from Pirates movies, maybe Nian Numb from Star Wars. He also spotted one that looks like the Rancor from Return of the Jedi, along with a curved bone similar to the one Luke used to brace its jaws. Russell on Discord thought another looked like a Chitauri. Now others have looked at this and thought some looked like otter bones for Lila, Rocket's companion from his volume one Xandar screen. Maybe we'll learn that Ego Slator took him through the High Evolutionary's creations, tying in Quill and Rocket's origins. There's more to this. I'm going to break this all down in a separate video. As you can tell, Guardians Volume 2 is a movie I have watched uh, more than once. But after rewatch number 12, and after the stack of bones gets too high, I like to give my peepers a rest with a nice audiobook. And this video is brought to you by Audible in their unmatched selection of audiobooks and other audio products. With so many of us stuck at home with libraries and schools closed, Audible has stepped up to help. They launched stories.audible.com for kids and parents stuck at home to stream lots of great stories for free. They got C.S. Lewis, Scarlett Johansson reading Alice in Wonderland, and a whole bunch more family-friendly stuff for free during quarantine at stories.audible.com. They also launched Audible Sleep, a free service with all kinds of bedtime stories, guided meditations, other ways that we can wrestle a good night of shut-eye back from the stress monsters invading all of our homes right now. They've even expanded the amount of content available to existing members. Members. That content includes the best selection of audiobooks, podcasts, and audible originals you can't find anywhere else. Their audiobook selection includes my old favorite, Jurassic Park, from Mikey Crichton. When I want to relax and forget my troubles, I just drift away to the tropical Isla Nublar, where Sam Jackson is giving me a back rub. Oh my god, the raptor ate him! Or finally get into that Game of Thrones, Stephen King, or Neil Gaiman book that you've been thinking about. Start listening with a 30-day audible trial. Choose one audiobook and two audible originals absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash newrocks or text New Rock Stars to 500 500. Again, that's audible.com slash New Rock Stars or text New Rock Stars to 500 500 for one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Let's jump back to Rocket. Taserface mutinies Yondu's loyals out the airlock, foreshadowing Yondu's own death. The captain going down with his true crew. Groot brings them Borker's Eye, a callback to Volume 1. There's one more thing we need to complete the plan. That guy's up! And Groot reveals he hates hats because he confuses hats for the shape of the head. A joke about how it's not really clear whether Yondu's fin is or is not part of his head in the comics versus in the movies. Richard Christie cameos as the Ravager who yells, Down there! That is also his name in the credits. He is a drummer for the heavy metal band Death. Rocket's tablet shows some interesting planet names. Treslar, Hala, Terma, Terra, and Ego. Terra's Earth, Ego's Ego. Hala is the Kree homeworld later shown in Captain Marvel. Dreslar and Terma are the weird ones. They show up at a crossover comic, Annihilation Conquest, which ties in the Guardians, Adam Warlock, and the High Evolutionary. Perhaps another clue to Rocket's origin. They blast past two fighting Cronins, the race of Korg, and the Cronin Thor killed in Dark World. They also passed our man Stan Lee. At that time, I was a Federal Express man. Now he's talking to Watchers. These are the overseers of the multiverse in the Marvel comics, with Uwatu the Watcher hosting the upcoming What If series. Stan's referring to his cameo as the FedEx guy in Civil War. But yes, this movie technically takes place before Civil War, but it has been hinted by Gunn and Kevin Feige and others that Stan could be a figure akin to the one above all 
in the Marvel comics who transcends all of time. They arrive at Ego, whose plants surface now as the face like his comic appearance. We're in an old piece of construction equipment Yandu once used to slice open the bank of Ascavari. They again reference Ascavarians, the tentacled race that Quill admitted to hooking up with in Volume 1, that Bank Heist could have been the mission where Peter did that deed. Ego gives Peter a vision, touching his forehead on that same G-spot that the Ancient One did to Strange. Eternity. Now, Gunn has debunked the theory that Peter's mother is the capital E Eternity or Lady Death, but he has, as of this recording, left the door open to Infinity, the other female entity in that Morag art. I just think Meredith must be someone important because Ego says that Meredith was the only partner strong enough to produce a viable heir. Not one of them carried the celestial genes. Until you, Peter. Among Ego's mates is a member of Mantis's race. The actress who stood up in this model claimed in a since-deleted post that she played Mantis's mom. And Gunn also posted a picture of her on his Instagram, but he clarified later that this model and Mantis are not related, so it seems like Mantis is not Peter's stepsister. But it is cool how they're hooking up here, but Ego is not touching her, because he doesn't want her to feel his deep, dark secrets. Ego reveals he gave Meredith the tumor, and he forces a link to Peter to expand like a tumor across the universe, including back in Missouri, where we get cameos of the Gunn's parents and later Peter's grandfather from Volume 1. Yondu breaks the chain. Hey there, jackass! He's repeating his diss from Volume 1. That guy was a jackass! Rocket pulled the same kamikaze move on Ronin in Volume 1, and Nebula pulls it on Thanos in Infinity War. Yondu and Peter float down with a Yaka arrow. I'm Mary Poppins, y'all! I like how Michael Rooker keeps his heels together like Mary Poppins. Rocket gets his hands on a big gun and gives us a yeah back. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And ego taunts. What greater meaning can life possibly have to offer? Yondu tells Peter that the way he controls his arrows with his heart and the chain plays once more as Peter flashes back. With Wyatt Olaf returning as young Peter, Peter chains himself to his real family, not the toxic ego. Or as Yondu says in his own words. He may have been your father, boy, but he wasn't your daddy. Rocket knew this sacrifice was coming. I can only afford to lose one friend today. That's also why it hurts Rocket so much in Infinity War and Endgame when he loses all of his friends in the same day. Yondu's corpse is decorated with his frog trinket and the troll doll from Volume 1. He's also got U.S. military service patches, Air Force and Army Captain's Bars, a National Defense Service Medal, an Army Ribbon for Good Conduct, and an Air Force Missile Maintenance Badge, aka a Pocket Rocket, given to specialists who have worked with guided missiles and ICBMs. Very fitting for Yondu's mastery over his guided arrow. Sometimes that thing you're searching for your whole life. It's right there by your side all along. You don't even know it. The family lesson learned by all the Guardians, including these sisters, who exchange a hug, even a little pat from Nebula. Kraglin gives Quill Yondu Zune, replacing the broken Meredith Awesome mix. The next song on this playlist was Cat Stevens' Father and Son, so this was the song Yondu was listening to as they returned to save Peter. I'm not crying, you're crying. And Yondu's sacrifice earns him the Ravager funeral he was previously denied. Dakar Ogord returns along with the other Ravager captains, including Charlie 27, Alita Ogord, in the comics that's Dakar's stepsister, that shares a Starhawk identity with him. A bit confusing. In the post credit scene, they will be joined by Martin X, Kruger, who's a limb sorcerer in the alternate universe Sorcerer Supreme, and Miley Cyrus in a vocal cameo as Mainframe. Another post credit scene shows Kraglin operating the Yaka Arrow. Another shows Aisha in Adam Warlock's Golden Birthing Pod, retconning the organic one for Volume 1. Adam is Aisha's genetically perfect male counterpart in the comics, plays a big role in the Infinity Gauntlet storyline, but he's left out of those movies, but he will be back. There's also a scene with Peter in Teenage Groot. On Groot's walls is some scroll lettering. There's the word maple on the right side wall. Maybe some other tree Groot's in too? And on the wall by the door, the scroll letters for you. Gunn actually just recently confirmed that 50 of the I Am Groot's in this movie are F-bombs. Maybe that includes some of the names in the credits where you can see I Am Groot showing up again and again. There's also cameos by Cosmo from Volume 1. The Hoff shows up. Howard the Duck. Peter's grandpa, and Jeff Goldblum as the Grandmaster, who will make his debut two movies later in Thor Ragnarok, breakdown coming next week, and then this jokey disclaimer about trees and raccoons not being harmed, but not the handlers. But back to the closing images. The colors of Ogord take the shape of an arrow to honor Yondu's Yaka arrow. His sacrifice helped this family conquer their poisonous egos. Groot embraces Drax. Peter and Gamora acknowledge their unspoken thing, and a single tear rolls down from Rocket over Cat Stevens' final words of the song. I know I have to go.
the words of a son letting go of his father. Now, of course, the daddies on the minds here are Peter's ties to Ego and Yondu, and Gamora and Nebula's ties to Thanos. But playing the lyric of a rocket's interesting, because his paternal chain is still a mystery. Is it the high evolutionary? Was the evidence in the boneyard? Time will tell. But this is the face of a trash panda who still needs to break the chain with a daddy somewhere to silence his ego and to join his true family. He knows he has to go. Join our future Infinity Saga watch-alongs on Discord by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash newrockstars. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstars. And subscribe to help us call Stranger Danger on a grown man in a school bathroom with minors. I mean, before I met Tony... Thank <laughs> you.